In 1977, an evangelist by the name of Leighton Ford was going to share the gospel at a conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And it just so happened that that same weekend, a man by the name of Billy Graham was going to share a message the following night. Now, if you're not familiar with who Billy Graham is, I know that's not many of you, but if you're not, Billy Graham is one of, if not the most famous and most impactful Christian evangelists in the history of our nation. And Billy decided that since he's here at this conference, that he has this bright idea. He's like, I'm going to go and I'm going to listen to Leighton's message. So he dresses a little differently than he normally does. He doesn't wear his usual suit and tie. He puts on a hat and some casual clothes and some dark glasses And he goes and listens to this message. So for anybody here that may would normally recognize Billy, it was kind of hard to tell it was him. So he's sitting and listening, and Leighton speaks, and he gets to the end of his message, and he does what most good evangelists do. And he gives an open invitation at the end of his message for anyone in that moment to pray and receive Christ. So Billy, he's sitting there, and he's thinking, well, he doesn't have to speak that night. So... Maybe he'll just do a little personal evangelism of his own. So he looks at the person in front of him, reaches down, taps him on the shoulder. Sorry about that. Taps him on the shoulder, and he says, excuse me, would you like to receive Christ? If you want, I'll walk down and I'll pray with you. Well, the man turns back, and he looks at Billy, looks him up and down, and he goes, nah. I think I'll just wait until the big gun comes tomorrow. So Billy said that he and Leighton would laugh about this story, and Leighton often talks about how he realized something that day, that when it comes to Christianity, a lot of times Christians think that evangelism, it's up to the big guns and not the little shots. We're continuing our sermon series, Core, today, and if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can go ahead and open them up to Matthew 28. And we're going to be talking today about sharing your faith. And I'm really excited to talk to you about this. And here's why. The gospel is the greatest news in the history of our world. In fact, the word gospel literally translates to good news. That it's the message of God's love for us. That God, despite our sin, loved us so much that he gave his son as a sacrifice for our sin. Though to anyone who believed in Jesus and his crucifixion and resurrection would have eternal life. Now that's good news. But here's the catch. Good news is only news if it's shared. And so if we're going to call the gospel the good news, that means that we have to share it with the world. And that means that it's not just up to the big guns to share it, that every single one of us are commanded to share our faith. So we're going to go ahead and jump into Scripture today. We're going to be looking at Matthew 28, and these are verses 18 through 20. It said, Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So our passage, it picks up directly after Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. And this is a pivotal time for Jesus and his disciples. Because I want to remind you that just before these moments, Jesus was dead. And I don't mean he was like a little dead. I mean he was dead dead. But three days after his death, Jesus rose from the grave. And when he did that, the hope of the disciples was renewed and empowered. And so Jesus uses this opportunity now, this interaction in Matthew 28, to both encourage his disciples, but also to give them a command to make disciples. And what we know happens because of Scripture and because of history is those disciples would go on and take the gospel to many nations, and they would give birth to the very church that we know of today. So why does Jesus' command to the disciples in Matthew 28 
still apply to you today? And why should you care about sharing your faith? Well, I want to talk to you today about two reasons that I think you should share your faith. So here's the first one. The power of the gospel is real. Now, when Jesus is talking with his disciples, before he gives them the command to go make disciples, he says this phrase. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, if you're familiar with any sort of theology whatsoever, then you're probably aware that Jesus already had all of the authority and all the power. That Jesus, he's God, and Jesus existed before creation. And so his power and his lordship was nothing new to Jesus. And really, it wasn't anything new to his disciples. But you also need to remember that just a few days ago, the disciples watched Jesus die on a cross. And in that moment, they felt like hope died with him. And that his power and authority were gone. But Jesus proved everything about who he said he was. And he reinforced everything that he did through ministry, through his crucifixion and his resurrection. And so when Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, I have all of the, all of the authority, he has proven it to his disciples. And so this was meant to be an encouragement as Jesus commands his disciples to go share their faith. Because for the disciples, they have now experienced firsthand the very real power of the gospel. And this would change everything for them. Because the same gospel disciples that at the cross would both scatter and deny Jesus are the same disciples who would take the gospel to the nations. And all but one of them would die for defending their faith. Now that kind of change, it doesn't happen through fairy tales or rumors. That kind of change happens through the very real power of God. And Paul said this about the gospel in Romans 1.16. He said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. That the gospel is just as powerful and miraculous and transformative today as it was from the moment that Jesus gave the original command to the disciples. And so if we believe that, then that should encourage us and empower us to share our faith. Because for many of you, you're here in this room today because you have experienced the very real, redemptive power of Jesus. That the gospel may have broken the strongholds of addiction in your life. Or maybe for some of you, it helped restore your marriages. And it gave you freedom. It gave you peace. But above all of that, the gospel gave you a relationship with God that's far greater than anything this world has to offer. And so if you've experienced that kind of transformative power in your life, if you've experienced the power of the gospel, why wouldn't you share that with other people? The world needs Jesus. And there are people around you who don't know him. And that means that the strongholds of sin still have a grip on their life. And that means that they need the gospel. And they need you to share your faith. And some of you may look at me and be like, look, I am not that comfortable with that. I don't love to do that. And so what I do is I don't share my faith, but I invite them to church. Now, I will say that I think inviting people to church is a really good thing. I've told you to do it multiple times. Inviting people to church is how I came to know Jesus. But if that's all you do, I think you're missing out on some real opportunities to make real life change around you. Because this is God's house. And we believe that when you gather as God's church, that you can experience the power and the presence of God. That's a real thing. But I want you to know that you are a living testimony of the power of the gospel. That you are a witness of what is possible through the gospel and what God can do through you. And so I want to encourage you to share your faith, not just your church. Because Jesus didn't command his disciples to take the nations to church. He said, take the gospel to them. And you may be sitting here 
thinking, well, Chris, I, I want to share my faith, but, but I don't have this crazy, powerful, ridiculous story of how I came to know Jesus. I wasn't some drug addict that God delivered to sobriety. I'm not a recovered alcoholic. I'm not a recovered porn addict. My marriage wasn't falling apart before Jesus. My life wasn't this big mess. I was just an ordinary person who gave my life to Jesus. And if that's my story, then my story isn't powerful. And I need you to know that that's not true, that your story is powerful, that the circumstances of the transformation in your life do not change the fact that you are a living, breathing testimony to the fact that God creates life from death, that you are the story of God chasing after his lost sheep, no matter how far or how little they've run, that your story is powerful because it's the power of the gospel. That you are a testimony to everything God has done. So don't believe the lie that your story isn't powerful because God has poured out his love and his mercy and his grace on you through faith. And that is a beautiful testimony of what's possible through God. And it's a story worth sharing. So share your faith, share the gospel because it's real and it's powerful. Now, the second reason that I think you should share your faith is that sharing your faith is a command, not a calling. So when Jesus gives the, the, the saying that he has all authority, he turns and he gives the disciples a command. He says, therefore, go and make disciples. And I need you to understand that this was not just a specific calling or commission that Jesus put on his disciples, but this was to be the mission of Jesus' church, that a disciple is a repetitive process. And so if we're going to do what the church has always done, then we're supposed to make disciples. But so often, many Christians don't understand that. In a study done by Lifeway Magazine back in 2018, they talked to a, to a bunch of Christians, and here's what they found out. That out of all the Christians they talked to, that 51% of them could not tell what the Great Commission was. They had no idea what it was. And out of the 49% who did know of the Great Commission, 50% of them couldn't say what it said. They just had heard of it. And if that statistic is not shocking enough for you, listen to this one. The Jesus Film Project did a survey back in 2020 with over 1,600 Christians. And they asked them a single question. And they said, would you share your faith based on two factors? If somebody was a Christian and if somebody wasn't a Christian. And I want you to see these results. That when they were talking to somebody who was a Christian, that 53 to 70% of Christians between the ages of 18 and 44 said they would absolutely share their faith with someone. And 60 to 72% of Christians over the age of 45 said they would share their faith. But here's where the statistic gets drastically different. If they're talking to somebody who is not a Christian, will you go ahead and go to the next one for me? They said that 62 to 73% of Christians between the ages of 18 to 44 said they would rarely or never share their faith. And 45 to 49% of Christians over the age of 45 said they also wouldn't share their faith. And in that same study, they asked the people who said they wouldn't share why. And here's what the four most popular reasons were. Fear, a lack of opportunity, they didn't feel like they were equipped, or nothing. They didn't have a reason. And so here's what these two studies pointed to in the church, is that for many Christians, they don't know how or why they're to share their faith. And for others, they just don't do it. So I think it's good to start here. If we're going to talk about you don't know why, you need to know what the Great Commission is. And so this is what the Great Commission is, is that Jesus has commanded you to go and make disciples. That Jesus said you were to baptize them and teach them everything he has commanded you. So the Great Commission is the command from Jesus that you are to go make disciples. But there may be some of you in the room who feel like that's not your job, that you feel maybe that evangelism is a really specific calling that only really specific people have. 
But I'm here to tell you today, that's not true. And I believe that there are certain roles that it does take a very specific person to do that. It takes a certain kind of crazy person to get up here and preach to you. And it takes a certain kind of person to get up and lead and pastor through worship. But every single one of you are commanded to share your faith. That's a calling that all of us have on our life. And it's just as important today to share your faith as it was back when Jesus had resurrected. Because I need you to know this, that the world today still desperately needs Jesus. Just in our country alone, studies now show that 33% of Americans don't believe in God. And so that means for you that there's a really, really, really good chance that one or more of your neighbors doesn't know Jesus. And more than that, there are over 2 billion people in the world who have never even heard the gospel once in their lifetime. The work is far from over. So I want to urge you and challenge you that you need to share your faith. Jesus said it this way in Luke 10 too. He said that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. There are people all around you who need to know Jesus. There are people in this world where there are areas that are still unreached. The harvest is plentiful. There are plenty of people to share the gospel with. But so many people are unwilling. The world needs the gospel. The world needs Jesus. And so it's up to us to take the message of the gospel, to take the good news out into the world. Because what good is a harvest if there are no workers to reap it? When I was in high school, I had a mentor. He used to take a couple of us down to a local mall in Jackson, Mississippi. And we would go to this mall a couple of days a week, and we had a really, really specific goal in going there. Our goal was to share the gospel. So we would do that through two ways, depending on how much time you had to talk with us. If you looked at us and you said you were in a rush, then we had a gospel track, which if you don't know what that is, that's kind of a little bit of an old school evangelism method. It's a piece of literature that shares the gospel with you. And if somebody said they didn't have time, we would say, here, take this, read this, Jesus loves you. But if somebody had time to talk with us, then we would actually have a short conversation with them where we would get the opportunity to share the gospel with them. And every once in a while, these short conversations... They would get really long, and they would turn into these deep, theological, almost even apologetic conversations as we had to kind of defend our faith before people. And it was not uncommon if you were talking in this mall to end up striking up a conversation with a Muslim. And I want you to know that talking to Muslims is probably one of my favorite things to do because they are so open about their faith. And so if you'll listen to them and what they have to say, They'll listen to you. And so there were multiple times where I would have two, three, four-hour conversations with the Muslim about their faith and about my faith. But out of all of those interactions, there was one in particular that has stuck with me for nine years. I was talking to a Muslim one day who had a pretty negative view of Christianity. He thought that we were all obsessed with sex, that we were lazy, And then we were all fat, which the last one I couldn't really argue with too much. But we got on the subject of Jesus, and we're talking about what I believed about Jesus. And so I'm telling this man, I'm saying, look, I'm a Christian. We believe that Jesus is God. We believe that he is Lord and Savior, that he loved us enough, that he gave his life for us. He lived the perfect life, died on a cross, and rose three days later. That's the Jesus I believe in. And this is what he said back to me. He said, if you all believe in this Jesus, this almighty God, so powerful and yet so loving, why does nobody tell me about him? 
And that moment left a deep impact in my life that has stuck with me for nine years. Because I never want to live in a world where somebody doesn't know who Jesus is. And I don't want to imagine a moment where a soul is condemned to hell and the only response they have before God is, I didn't know. No one told me. The world needs the gospel. And it needs you to share it. The gospel is real and it's powerful. And you're commanded to share your faith. So don't miss out on that opportunity. There is eternity at stake for the lives around you. So make the choice today to be obedient to what God has called you to and to share your faith. In just a second, we're going to take communion and worship together. And if you're not familiar with communion, it's simply a time that we take each week where we get to reflect and thank God for everything that he did for the sacrifice of his son. And as we take this time of reflection and worship together, I want to read a scripture to you. This is Romans 10, 13 through 15. It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they tell, call on the one who they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That the gospel, it's the greatest news in the world. And it's beautiful when we get to take that into the world. But it takes a commitment. And it takes you doing that. So like Paul, I want to let you know, this is me sending you out. That I urge you and I challenge you to live the life that Jesus has commanded you to live. To share your faith with others. So will you do it? Will you share the gospel? Will you live out the Great Commission? Will you reap the harvest with God? Or you leave the fields empty. As we take communion together, what I want you to do is take this time to pray. And I want you to pray for two things in particular. I want you to pray first for boldness. Pray that God would ignite a passion in you to share your faith. Because the gospel is real and the gospel is powerful. And the world needs to hear it. The second thing I want you to do is similar to something we did the very first week of this series. I want you to take an opportunity today to pray for someone you know that doesn't know Jesus. And just like a couple of weeks ago, in the back of the room there's a cross and there's note pa- uh, sticky notes at the cross. What I want you to do is I want you to take that sticky note, write down the name of someone you know that doesn't know Jesus. Place it on that cross. I want you to pray for them. But I want you to pray for something a little different than you did last time. Pray for them to know Jesus, but I also want you to pray that God would give you an opportunity to share your faith with them. Pray that he would give them the openness to hear what you have to say, that they would be receptive to the gospel. So we'll have one song together here in just a second, but take this opportunity to respond to God, to be obedient, to live out the calling that God has placed on your life, that the world needs the gospel and it needs you to share it. Let's pray. Man, you guys can be seated. Uh, I don't know if you thought that y'all were just gonna get like a really early lunch or you thought that I may have preached like the world's shortest sermon, but uh, we're not done, so I hate to disappoint you with that. Y'all should know me better than that by now. Um, But we talked for the majority of our time together about why you should share your faith. Well, I wanna take our last few minutes together, and I do mean few minutes, don't worry, to talk about why or how you can share your faith. And so you may have kind of felt like you were about to leave this sermon going, all right, I I feel like I should share my faith. I'm ready to do it, but I don't know how. So if that's you, here's what I want to do. I want to give you three practical steps that you can take to help you share your faith with somebody this week. So we're going to just go ahead and jump into it together. Here's the first one. Pray. And I want you to pray for a couple of different things because I know that prayer seems like the most obvious answer for a pastor to give you, but prayer is powerful. So before you ever share your faith, I want you to pray. 
And so here's what you can pray for. First, I want you to pray for boldness and peace. Because if 22% of Christians feel like sharing their faith is uncomfortable or scary, well, there's a good chance you might too. But I want to remind you of what Jesus said in John 14, that you, if you are a follower in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And that means that the power of God resides in you. So you can pray to God to fill you with the power of his spirit, that he would encourage you and give you the same boldness that the original disciples to have when they carried the gospel out into the world. But you can also know that as scary and as uncomfortable as sharing your faith can seem like it is, that Jesus also said in John 14 that you can have the peace of God because the Holy Spirit brings the peace of God. And the peace of God transcends all understanding. So that means that in the moments where you're uncomfortable or you're uneasy or you're scared, God can put you at ease. The other thing that you can pray for is that God would give you opportunities to share your faith. Now, I need to tell you with this that you already have opportunities to share your faith. I hate to, to be the bearer of bad news to you. But if you look at the original translation of go make disciples, it's actually better translated as as you're going make disciples. So the whole point of Jesus' original command was that you're going to run into people every single day who need Jesus. But what you can pray for specifically is that God would open your eyes to those situations and open your eyes to those opportunities, and that he would also give those people an openness to hear what you have to say. So before you do anything else, pray. Now, the second thing you can do, if you want to share your faith as effectively as possible, you can build relationships with people. Because if you want people to be receptive to you and to the message you have to share, you got to get to know them. It's really, really, really important. If you go look at what made the church in Acts 2, which is kind of the original church, so wildly successful, they did two things really well. One, they had a really big boldness to share the gospel. Shocker. But the second thing they did is that they were really, really, really good at relationships, that they got to know people on a different kind of level, and they built deep and lasting relationships as they were with people 24-7. And so this is a really, really important step that you can take in getting, sharing your faith, is getting to know people. In fact, a recent survey done in 2021 by the Barna Group, they talked with younger generations. And here's what they found about younger generations. That 72% of non-Christians said that they would be way more receptive and willing to listen to someone about their beliefs if that person was a good and active listener. So what that means is that if you want people to listen to you and the message you have to share, listen to other people. Get to know them. Build relationships with people. And so my encouragement and my advice to you in this is I would stay away from the street corner preacher method of sharing your faith and probably shy away from arguing your point of view on social media and Facebook and things like that. And just build relationships with people. Get to know them. Ask people questions. Build deep, lasting relationships with people. Because if you'll build those relationships, the opportunities to share your faith are going to come up naturally. Now, the third and last step that you can take to share your faith this week. Share your story. I want to remind you that I told you earlier that you are a powerful testimony to the fact that God creates life out of death. And so your story is the story of transformation, and that is the most powerful tool that you have in evangelism, in sharing your faith. And so I want to encourage you to share your specific story. And if you don't know how to do that, here's what we're going to do. I want to show you an example of what this looks like in Scripture. This is 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16. This is Paul. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So what I love about this passage is a couple of things. One, to me, it is a perfect example of sharing your faith. And two, I love that it's Paul's whole life story in four verses. 
It's a really short version of it, but this is what Paul's life looked like before Jesus, when he met Jesus, and after he met Jesus. And so what's interesting about this and encouraging to me is that we can share our faith in the exact same way. So that's exactly what I want to show you how you can do. I want to give you a simple formula that will help you share your faith the same way that Paul did. So here's what it is. is your life before Jesus plus faith and grace equals your life after Jesus. And if that seems really simple, that's because it is. So let me break it down with you real quick. You want to talk to people, the very first thing you should do is tell people what did your life look like before Jesus. And what you want to do when you do this is be honest about your story. But you can also be brief. People don't have to know every single detail of your story, but you can do what Paul did and give them kind of the important bullet points of your life and what it looked like before Jesus. And so as you do that, there will be a a pivotal moment in your life where you gave your life to Christ. This is the moment where you responded in faith for the first time and received the grace of God through faith in Jesus. So you need to tell people about this specific story. How did you meet God? How did you come to the decision to follow him? And this is also a great place where you can share the actual gospel itself, whether that's John 3.16 or other scripture. And so you do that. You talk about your life before Jesus. You talk about meeting Jesus and what you gave, how you gave your life to him. And then you get to talk about your life after Jesus. And this is really similar to the before. But you want to give people kind of the important bullet points of how does your life look differently now that you follow Jesus. And that's it. That's all three parts of this formula. It is a simple, easy method to share your story. But it is a powerful tool that you have in sharing your story because people are impacted by seeing the ways that Jesus has changed your life. And so what you can do is you can share that. You can share your story with other people. And so what I want you to do this week is I want you to take some time to think about that. Sit down and think for a minute. What's my story? What did my life look like before Jesus? How did I meet Jesus? And what does my life look like now? And once you have that, go share that with someone. Share your story with someone. In just a second, I'm going to pray for us. And I'm going to close us out today. And we're going to sing one last song together. And as we do that, you can go ahead and put it up. It's okay. I want to give you a quick challenge as we leave today. I want you to share your faith story with one person this week. So what I want you to do is I want you to take some time this week and think through your story, just like we talked about. What did your life look like before Jesus? How did you give your life to Christ? And what does it look like now? Once you have that, I want you to take that story and I want you to go share it with somebody. It's simple, it's easy, but it's powerful. And so I also want you to know that as you do that, I don't want you to wait I want you to make a commitment right here, right now, to share your faith with somebody this week. Because there's somebody out there that needs to hear your story. So pick one person. That can be the person you prayed for earlier, or it can be somebody different, but pick one person and share your faith with them. Because the gospel, it's real, and it's powerful, and the gospel will change the world. So let's change the world together. Let's share the good news of Jesus with the world because good news is only news if it's shared. Let's pray.